Now I'd like to request Professor Vanna Nanal, General Secretary of IPA, to give her remarks. Let me briefly introduce her. Professor Vanna Nanal is currently Professor at Department of Nuclear and Atomic Physics, Tata. She did PhD from TFR in 1994, and her thesis work was on focused on measurement of compound nuclear lifetime using crystal blocking technique. Her research interest cover a broad spectrum ranging from nuclear physics, accelerator physics to interdisciplinary areas with a particular emphasis on development of detectors and associated instrumentation. She's a joint chair of BRC TIFR Peloton LINAC facility in Mumbai. She's leading the national effort on a feasibility study of neutrino less double beta decay. She's a member gender in physics working actively working on women and science issues and science outreach. So with this word, may I request uh, Professor Vandana to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Avasti, for kind introduction and uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to the students. A very warm welcome to all the uh, students who are watching this program, either through Zoom or through YouTube or whichever channel may be uh, online mode. So as I told last week, this is one of the examples where we uh, turn just into opportunities. So this is the uh, COVID situation has forced us to go online. And I think the UPAS has, is really to be congratulated for coming up with this proposal of this uh, series and very successfully executing it. Uh, it's, uh, today, I'm particularly happy to be here because uh, Dr. Archana is going to talk to you about developments at uh, CERN. As Dr. Avasti mentioned, the biggest laboratory and she has played a very big role in uh, there. And it's uh, very nice to see that, uh, you know, in school we always think of the science subject as a difficult subject, science, maths, and uh, it feels daunting. And particularly, I think in our society for girls, it's even more daunting. So then you feel, Ki, may I be able, will I be able to do it? So I think the today's lecture brings, not only will bring you the mysteries of the universe and how to probe about it, but it also comes from Archana. So it is really from horse's mouth, you will get to hear that what you can do if you want to do. And in that sense, it will be very uh, inspirational. And I'm sure you will all enjoy that. So that's why I'm really, really happy to be here today. And just a brief word on behalf of IPA that, uh, as some of you know, the Indian Physics Association was founded in 1970. And one of the main jobs in the last five decades is to sort of interface and also bring to younger people, young researchers, the knowledge and the latest developments to, uh, to their uh, attention. So this is a really a good, this series offers us a very good opportunity because uh, you are the future of the world, not just India. So it's important for us to bring you the excitement of science to you. It's not just the basic science research or that you will get PhD and do something, but it has a lot of aspects of our life, the technology in the daily life, starting from your smartphone, as I mentioned last time it is there. And today when uh, Dr. Archana is talking about many detectors, you will see how it has made headways in the many aspects. So I hope that and I'm sure this series will bring, uh, bring out your intrinsic interest in science because I'm sure all of you have that. The curiosity and the interest is there. It's just that we need, we need to provide you with opportunities and this series is one really great effort in that. So I congratulate all the organizers once again for that from Dr. Thank you, Professor Vanna. Now, before I invite uh, Dr. Archana Sharma to deliver the lecture, I'll briefly introduce her. Dr. Archana Sharma is a principal staff scientist at the CERN Laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland active in the field of uh, in this field since 1989 making mainly working on instrumentation she is the pioneer of simulations and experimentation on gaseous detectors in high energy physics over the last three decades a phd in particles in 1989 and a dsc from university of geneva in 1996 she has worked at r and d 
CERN experiments and commissioning of large scale gaseous detectors. She also serves as a senior advisor for relations with international organizations at CERN and focuses on capacity building in India with her foundation. So with this small uh, uh, introduction, may I request now Dr. Archana Sharma for the, for the lecture. Over to Archana. Namaskar, sir. Hello, one's generous uh, introduction. And also thank you very much to speak to the students and to share my excitement of the work that I do. And let us not call it a lecture. It's really a conversation, you know, and I think uh, that students, teachers and, uh, you know, uh, lay people in general also engage with what we do because every single day, particularly the pandemic has taught us that science is in our lives and it impacts uh, life and society far beyond the classroom. That spirit, am I audible properly? Yes. yes Very yes. good. So I will just share my screen and uh, Vandaji, thank you very much for throwing the challenge on this side. And I'm very much up to the challenge because I believe that uh, it's about empowering the young boys and girls, of course, and that's important. Uh, that's really going to be the, the main focus of what I would like to, uh, to take this forward now. I hope I have this right. Um, it's called the key. I'm not sure if I'm showing the right screen. So my screen is visible. Yes. Yeah, visible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, indeed, we will. The title is very ambitious: unlocking secrets of the universe, as if we are going to do it right away in an hour with you. But the thing is, like Vannaji says, curiosity is the main uh, driver for not only us looking at answers and when we ask questions with the help of science and technology we are able to solve some of the questions that are posed on the right side top hand uh, on the right hand top side of this picture you see an aerial view of where i am right now uh, you see geneva you see the airport of geneva um, the strip you can see on the top right and you see a circle. It is an imaginary circle of 27 kilometers where the Large Hadron Collider is built underground. And underground is the experiment where you see my picture with my experiment. Uh, little tractors uh, like uh, object, which I will explain when we get to that point. But just to say that it is very, very exciting to imagine when I grew up, I would have never, never dreamt that this is what I'm going to do in life. So the big uh, message here is really that you can dream, you can think, and you can curate what you want to do. Just because it, you know today, and knowledge today is at, the, at your fingertips. So you can uh, shorten this span of a career that took me 30 years into 20 years or even 15 years from what from the advantage of hindsight from where I And if you look very, very closely uh, next to the airport, uh, you will not see, but you can imagine that's where I'm sitting because my house is just on the bottom uh, left of that picture of the uh, screenshot that you see of the satellite uh, map. So yes, at CERN, there is, it's like a mega science project. You heard the term mega science now, I hope a lot, because the challenges of the world today, like global warming or the pandemic for that matter, is not possible to be solved unless we are all together working in scientific research to find solutions like for the pandemic the vaccine was created when 
So at CERN as well, we do mega science and there are challenges, of course, and opportunities for every single person to engage, to learn, to work or to communicate, create a social impact. And some of you who might not really be imagining that I want to do a PhD, but I would like to do a business based on these scientific ideas, you know, opportunities for industrial engagement as well. So I do hope that uh, you all look uh, into um, finding questions, looking for answers, finding challenges and the opportunity that lies in it for you. India is uh, participating not only at CERN, but in many, many different mega science projects, you may have heard of Vigyan Samagam. That was an exhibition in India that was curated in 2019. It went throughout the country in 2020, uh, in 2019. And I hope that you have had an opportunity to, to take a look at all the experiments marked on the left top of the slide, like FAIR, Bell, STAR, Fermilab, LIGO, certainly you have heard of LIGO because of the encounters and the gravitational waves. And of course, our Indian national uh, mega science experiment called INO, Indian Neutrino Observatory, and ITER, where um, energy, uh, thermal energy is uh, being investigated for the future. Because you know that goals of our planet is to remain green and then engage with uh, if you have research and we ask questions you know questions like what is the universe from where did we come we meaning the universe itself are there other um, multiverses out there or is this just the single universe and if I am made of matter, where is my antimatter cousin? Or if at all they are there? And there are many, many other questions that are, um, that are there still open on physics, in science. And I'm sure you all also have many, many questions. And you know, Chiti, that on, lives on a table, which is of two dimensions. And she spends all her life on the the table. I cannot imagine that there is a third dimension, up and down. She imagines that there are only two dimensions. So are we stuck in not asking the right questions? Are there other dimensions that we do not know about? So these are the questions that we look uh, at CERN and we try to answer them in projects that are wide ranging in terms of technology, because you know, to look for something, you need something like a microscope. You need to look inside matter to try to understand the heart of the matter and also what, what is the fundamental constituent of matter. Therefore, we need instruments. And in answering questions, we create technologies that then thrive in international collaboration. So do not imagine that Archana is doing fantastic work at CERN and she has done this and she has done that. No, I am part of a collaboration and teamwork is extremely important for science of the future. We will not be able to solve any of these questions sitting in a corner by our need to collaborate. And that collaboration and investment in collaborations pay dividends to our society our country and to the planet as well. So you may have heard of these terms like the Higgs boson or the God particle, the Large Hadron Collider, the World Wide Web. That's why we are here today. We are able to, to speak to each other because somebody somewhere, a young 23 year old thought about how to share data among physicists. And that's how the World Wide Web was born. And I don't have to tell you what is, has been the result of that. Uh, that was done in 1989, 90, and 30 years later, the planet's surface has completely changed in terms of how we communicate, how we interact, how we do business, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, there are many projects and I will go through them again by trying to imagine what is this curiosity that uh, brings us together uh, asking these, look at answering these open questions, that why at all are, are we here? You know, matter and antimatter should have been equal. 
when they have they were produced at the time of the Big Bang. Now I use the term Big Bang, and I'm assuming that you have heard about it, which just says that the presently accepted model of the universe is that it was created at a singularity that's called the Big Bang. And most of the observations in particle physics, in cosmology, in astronomy, all answer to the question that yes, there was a Big Bang and how the universe was very, very hot at the time and uh, that we still are moving around. You know, we are not sitting quiet. We are actually revolving uh, at 220 kilometers per second. Can you imagine that? And I'm sure you that brings a lot of questions in your mind. I would like you to ask the questions and it's not guaranteed that you have answers. So you want to ask these questions. You want to understand what is the universe and how at all the phases, which are the different phases after the Big Bang that happened and that we were created. So you and I and everything around us were together, you know, in this big soup from where we were formed. So we share not only our genes, but we also share our protons and we also share the quarks and the gluons and everything else that was there at the time of the Big Bang. So asking questions is very important, particularly among the young people in the audience, you would imagine, and of course, everybody knows about the proverbial apple that led to, although today, if you ask a three-year-old, four-year-old, you know, uh, why do things fall down? He will answer gravity. But it's the, the question that has to be asked that you get an answer to. So today it looks trivial, but not when Newton actually articulated the laws of motion and gravity. The same um, argument holds for Einstein. It's very difficult, all the work that he has done in terms of equations and relativity, special relativity, uh, kinematics, and all those kind of things. In your mobile phone, when you go to Google Maps and then you just move around where you wish, or when you're going in your car or the airplanes or the uh, other means of transport, they all depend on these equations that he articulated. And not only that, of course, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect. However, there are many, many contributions that come from scientists and STEM that you are studying in school. And we got a lot in our lives today on our table food that we eat is there because somewhere somebody uh, is able to transport the sugar that comes to my house or the food that is coming from India. You know, I can get awesome uh, Indian food just because, you know, uh, people are able to pack them up and send them in airplanes. And how did we get airplanes? Because someone was curious, right? So you would like to imagine that whatever you study is not for the sake of getting great grades at the end of the year, but to make a difference to the lives of people, to the lives of society, to, to society on. So yes, now you uh, have heard about the Big Bang and now you have heard about Big Bang Theory as well. I know you have seen the episodes of Big Bang Theory uh, on TV, and that's equally exciting. This one is much more exciting, much more challenging. And the questions remain. You have loads and loads of questions. You want to answer these questions and you have many times, many a time, not an idea of what the answers could mean. So just a very, very quick um, refreshing, refresher on the temperatures and the time you, you see on this slide, you see at the time of inflation, core Formed, first particles are formed. This all this is happening in milliseconds. And then in the first hundredth of a second, nuclei form. And then the first light atoms form. The, and then clumps of matter are formed in the dark ages, that is 300, 400 years later, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and so on. And today we are dreaming and imagining for about 14 billion years later. Uh, why are we still here? and why we're moving. So yes, how do we look into the heart of matter is the question. And let's try to do an experiment together. And how do we do it? Let's build helicopters. I'm sure you recognize that these are built out of Lego pieces, right? And when I collide them, 
you know, you want to break things and only then you'll be able to see inside how they are built. So suppose you did not know how they are built or what are the fundamental units, you see that when I crash them together, I'm able to get others, but still they are not the fundamental pieces, right? You agree with me? They are not the fundamental pieces. So what should we do? We should increase the energy with which they collide, right? You agree? Let's try that now. So this is a bit slower, but okay. Now we collide with more energy and what happens? Now we are able to break them into constituent particles. And these are the fundamental building blocks. So now you know about, you've heard about atoms, you've heard about protons, electrons, and so on. And all, all the all the mental particles uh, have been found. And that study of particles is called particle physics, right? And all these particle physics um, and the, the forces that exist between them can then be written in one equation. And this is the famous equation that describes the structure of matter, for which you, you will see later, somebody got the Nobel Prize also. However, it also explains all what we see around us, nearly. Not completely, but so I invite you to study these things on your own, but now you know what is the context we are talking about. And you have studied in your school about the current understanding of matter. I'm sure all of you are well aware up to the point where you have an atomic nucleus surrounded by electrons. And uh, inside the nucleus, you've got protons and neutrons, and these protons and neutrons also have a substructure. And this substructure, there are final particles, gluons, which are not really, uh, they cannot be separated. So they are confined in this uh, hadronic soup inside the nucleus. So they are protons and neutrons. And of course, together they are called hadrons. That's why you may have heard of the large hadron collider, right? And of course, the leptons, they are the lighter particles like the electron and cousins of the electrons. They are called the, the leptons. So you remember hadrons and leptons. So how did we find all that? Again, we smashed things together. And as I explained to you, we have been smashing things together and we now are able to build atom, right? Together, quarks together make protons and neutrons. And with the lepton, that is the electron, one of the leptons, we are able to make atoms. And you see how nicely we built a helium atom. So fantastic. So now you know we built helium and we can then build the universe once we know how to build the fundamental block, uh, building blocks, right? However, why is it so important? You, I'm sure you agree that to, we found a vaccine for the coronavirus simply because using a scanning uh, transmission electron microscope achieves a better uh, resolution than a photo on microscope, right? Magnifications were able to give us a very clear picture of the virus. Only then a vaccine could be found. So quantum mechanics is extremely important, even though it sounds so daunting, but believe me, it was the same for me as well. I said, when will this course finish? But when you start relating that with real life applications, it becomes very, very interesting. And that was really thanks to all the tools that we had in terms of understanding of matter, plus the a simulation to exist in terms of how matter behaves, open the door to the vaccine of the pandemic. And you can search your problem on the planet that you are going to, to solve by looking at questions that are open in physics, like the origin of mass, like the nature of dark matter. You must have heard about dark matter and dark energy uh, because all what we observe is only 5%. Where is the rest? Suppose if I had a very big magnet under my table and I had some magnetic pins on, my, on the top of my table, and if I did not know about the magnet, I was able to find out that yes, there is one simply by the movement of these pins and, and other magnetic stuff on my table. In the same way, it's the gravity measurements out there in the, in the cosmos that have given us this information that there is much more out there than we see. 
So yes, we need to look at uh, how can we go further? Can we produce what is, uh, this dark matter uh, in terms of uh, particles or are they particles or is it another form? Is it energy? What is it? So what am I going to do now? I meaning we as scientists, we are going to do more experiments. So let's give more energy to our helicopters, right? Maybe just because of the fact that there is more energy, some new particles can form that I do not expect. So let's try this experiment. Boom. Oh, what happened? We saw out from energy. Now, do you believe in dinosaurs? Of course you do. And why do you do that? Have you, have you seen one? Nobody has seen one, but we have seen signatures. We have seen fossils. We have seen footprints, right? Similarly, we have seen, we want to see footprints of particles that existed at the time of the Big Bang and do not exist anymore today. So we increase the energy and we create an accelerator where we can collide beams of particles and in a very tiny, tiny space with the temperatures that are close to that of the Big Bang and temperatures, temperatures and energy, sorry, uh, that are really high and that could probably give us clues on how the Big Bang actually happened and what were the particles existing at that time and give us more uh, secrets of the universe, so to speak. So yes, I'm sure you recognize a lot of things on this slide, right? The cats and the dogs and the monkeys and the donkeys and so on. However, you also see unexpected things, right? Aliens, for example, we do not know. So there could be theories of dark matter like may have, some of you may have heard, do if they exist, then we will be able to create those particles in our experiments. And that would be amazing. That would be the next Nobel Prize. And that's why you need to study particle physics and develop technologies to be able to see these fantastic, unexpected, unsuspected future, um, future experiments um, that will produce this kind of physics. But that's not simple because even today in my experiment, we are more than 5,500 people that are doing one experiment. And we have two experiments that actually um, are working at the moment of this size at CERN. And, but you, have, you are convinced we need accelerators that are powerful machines that will accelerate these particles. Then we need detectors, of course. Only creating these particles is not enough. We need to take pictures of these and you know, with your camera, you will be able to take how many pictures in one second? Maybe three, four, five, perhaps, if you have a very smart camera. However, we need to take pictures 40 million times per second. So we have instruments that are very, very sensitive so that we are able to locate what's coming out of these collisions and we are able to find the exact timing of when what particle was created. And of course, all that will need computing because without algorithms, how are we going to look and st uh, study the data that is produced? And of course, for doing that, we need to collaborate. We need you, we need students, we need scientists, engineers, technicians, and then we need managers. We need the whole legal system because if we collaborate with, uh, with institutions in India or in, on in, with institutions all over the globe, we need to um, have systems and mechanisms in place so that we are able to exchange funding, exchange uh, students, exchange uh, you know, uh, um, materials. So you can imagine the kind of management that is needed. Apart from that, we need to have these infrastructures in place and they can happen on on a global scale. A local scale you will engage while you will be experimenting on a global scale. Here you see the four facets of experimentation, the accelerator, the experiment, the computing, and then of course the worldwide network on how this work will be done. 
That's what you see inside the largest microscope on the planet. That's the tunnel. And you see a very long accelerator section inside this tunnel. That's, again, the picture that I showed you in the beginning. And of course, it relates to all the questions that we have just asked. And we have several experiments on this ring that I mentioned. They are the two big ones. The two big ones are CMS, that's my experiment, and ATLAS is the other experiment. And you notice one thing very nicely, that the accelerator sits across two countries. One is Switzerland, that's on the right-hand side of this picture, and France on the left. So the protons are actually colliding 40 million times a second, but they are crossing the border 12,000 times per second without passports or visas and so on. So imagine the cooperation between the two countries where these kind of collaborations exist and the experiments actually are possible. So this is again a lesson also in scientific di diplomacy where uh, people can work together across the border, crossing the border so many times a day and are still able to work. So one goal because even though these two experiments that I mentioned, the ATLAS experiment and the CS, CMS experiment, they are different experiments. And you see the sizes here because you see a tiny person also on the floor compared to the size like a six story building, very, very heavy experiments of thousands of tons, you know, one elephant is 700 tons. So imagine you can divide how many elephants we have inside one experiment there. So we, um, we need to have these systems and eventually build them. You can see here, this is part of my experiment, CMS. Some more pictures, you know, moving these objects down into the cavern underground because the experiments are actually underground, 100 meters underground from the surface. And uh, there was no crane on the planet that could handle these heavy objects. So cranes were built in situ to manage these kinds of problems. So you see challenges come every single day to master them. Here you see uh, another picture where one of the detectors that my uh, collaboration has built is being installed. And it was a big moment because it was one of the last uh, pieces that is that was being installed here. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, nothing can happen without collaboration. So you need to remember that competition days are over. We need to collaborate and complement each other's skills because the skills required are immense. The spends, and we need now to really engage with becoming an expert in something that can be complemented by the expertise of another person. And I just learn these new things every single day because we have collected um, several hundred petabytes of data. I just about understood what is petabyte, you know. Uh, after moving through the megabyte and gigabyte era. And just when I understood that, I start learning that now we have to move into the exabyte and zettabyte eras. You know, zettabyte, if I understood, is a trillion gigabytes. So just imagine how much of data are we looking at. And then an exabyte, few exabytes are all the way mankind. So now, Think of the challenge, the data challenge that we have. And of course, I am not a, not a specialist of data management, but you can imagine how, what kind of a challenge did we have to look for the Higgs boson. We would find it only one Higgs boson out of in 10 to the 11 of these events that we have. And keeping all the data is very, very difficult. So we have to just sift the data online and within the, uh, the time that we record data, out of the 40 million, we need to keep only a thousand or less data on tape to be studied later. So all these challenges were overcome. And of course, there were new techniques developed, intelligence, and of course, deep learning, machine learning, all these things are really springing out for from these experiments you could become one of the next experts of the of the next decades because these are tools that are now you know being integrated in business in finance in risk management etc cetera, etc cetera, and bigger challenges however here we found the higgs boson in 2012 
And this was amazing because there was a seminar that was done in 2012. We just had uh, the ninth anniversary on July 4th. And you see that uh, the Higgs boson was announced uh, worldwide. And this has been an incredible journey where the Nobel Prize was then awarded to Peter Higgs and to Francois Engler following the observation of the Higgs boson at CERN. I did not go into the detail of the plot, otherwise it would take too long, but feel free to Google about that. And of course, a big Indian participation is there as well. And you see nice pictures of uh, the collaboration in Indi India called India CMS. And you see so many girls are there right in front and they have been the backbone of a lot of the computing and analysis to be working there. Yes, so the World Wide Web born at CERN. And these are the, the flags of many, many different countries that work together at CERN. And this web I mentioned earlier was born in 1890, but today it has infiltrated every single household, every single school, college, university, institution. And you can see and imagine, and perhaps you can already write down the applications of the World Wide Web without me prompting you. So yes, accelerators and detectors are very, very important. And to only two, three big, big accelerators like the LHC. Of course, the LHC is the largest accelerator and there are many different kinds of designs. And in India also, we have several accelerators operational. However, uh, most of them are used for medical science on health and so on. And hadron therapy, which I, is close to my heart, is, is something that uh, you all will be picking up the students, I mean, for the next generation. And then, of course, you might wonder what does antimatter bring to us? But antimatter has given us positron emission tomography, which gives us a good imaging of uh, for health applications. So hadron therapy, you know that x-rays, when you, when you bombard a tumor with x-rays, you are damaging healthy tissues as well. However, when you use hadrons, now you know what is a hadron, like protons or ions and so on, they will deposit energy at the tumor. You can tune such that only the tumor is targeted, right? So this is a very, very, um, how can I say, um, um, new technique, but relatively new because in the West and in Japan, in China, in the United States, it's already in operation, not in India. We have a machine that has been purchased in Apollo, Chennai, and another one that is coming up in Mumbai as well. But then there's lots and lots of room to study, to learn, and then to engage in this field. I will not go into the details, but just highlighting the fact that in our country, we absolutely need uh, these facilities and for medical applications of accelerators and uh, detectors and computing as well, we need centers like these that are already existing based on the technologies that have been studied at CERN. This is just another picture to show you uh, how radiation detectors can be useful. And imagine that the delight of a doctor when the doctor is able to see these kind of pictures right in front rather than those hazy x-rays that, that have been the norm. Now you can look inside the body without being invasive and without giving the, the dose that is usually given in terms of um, of x-rays to the body. So these are developments which can be picked up and of course a lot of work goes on uh, behind. It's not, It's very beautiful for me to show these pictures but this, this is a work done over 10 years. So that was the Large Hadron Collider, the experiments and some of the have been coming out in the last 30 years. However, there are many, many new projects on the horizon. I will not list them, but just highlight and flash that there is one coming up, which has a circumference of 100 kilometers. And it is somehow dwarfing the LHC, as you see on the right side of the picture. And this will be a very, very big uh, installation. And uh, it's foreseen to, uh, the, uh, to get started around 2040. So young people are needed, like you, and you need to be uh, really engaged if this fires you up. It's not easy, but it's, uh, it's not impossible. And you just need to get engaged so that you study the right things and you will be able to get enough experience so that you will be the leaders for tomorrow. And for that, 
a small uh, offering has been made by a couple of my students. You know, you see the names Robin Koshi Matthews, he is in Hyderabad, and Ben Richards, he is in Edinburgh. And together we wrote a very quick, uh, a very nice little book, which is just a fun book about the A to Z of CERN universe unlocked. I'll quickly show you to, uh, what this I go fast because it's really something you will see how this book is given. And this is part of the work I do with my foundation as well. Okay, so you got the picture that, um, that we are making um, available just fun things also to, for students to engage. And uh, by now, I guess that you all are nicely lost and nicely confused and disoriented and bewildered, just like I was when I started studying nuclear physics, which everybody says was an unclear physics. And clearly it was the tip of the iceberg. However, I wanna highlight some of the, our women leaders here who are working in the field, just like me and uh, many more all over the world. In fact, not only at CERN, some of them are at CERN, India, some are in the United States, but you can recognize many of them here, I hope. And uh, you see here Rohini Godbole, she is Padma Shri and she's working in IISC Bangalore. So you see that you have enough role models for the young girls out there who, will, who can imagine that yes, it's possible in any way that you want to engage, you can. And you, you, it will not be easy. Nothing that is worth something is easy. So you absolutely need to work on it. And imagine here is the star, not far from where you are today. So this is in Jhansi, my school, you see my school assembly, my teachers helping me work and helping me learn. And then you see on the bottom right, that's the CERN uh, laboratory where I landed up for the first time without knowing anything, how to do anything, you know, uh, because I never worked in a laboratory in India. But slowly, 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 very, very slowly, I managed to create a place for myself. I learned a few things that I thought what would be uh, in maybe I'll just show you a couple of pictures here in the second from the left is a new detector that uh, I have invented and I have a patent for that as well which is now going to be used in the future circular collider you know the 1000 uh, 100 kilometer circumference that's going to be worked there what I did in the 80s 90s and the 2000s is actually sitting in CMS in the CMS experiment so you see this is the, the big um, big uh, new detector, the new detector system that I have steered with my collaboration with my team to, um, to, to bring about in CMS as a new contribution. So yes, my message is really that anyone can with collaboration, with cooperation, with complementarity. And whatever you will learn, whatever you will learn in particle physics, you can bring back out into society because 67 to 70% of our PhDs go and do something else. They do not remain in particle physics. So the training ground here starts in a very rounded manner, not only the physics, the theory, the experiment, computation, the, the engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that gives you a good sense of how you can plug into highly demanded industrial sectors of India. You can see what's coming up. This is just me Googling and trying to understand what's, what's needed in India. And these are some of the sectors like commerce, e-commerce, uh, infrastructure, information technology, healthcare and retail, and what you will learn in particle physics or the experimentation in particle physics is applicable everywhere. I have uh, convinced you that your curiosity can be possibly unlocking not only the secrets of the universe, but it can impact lives of millions, even billions of people. And how do, does one do that? By engaging into particle physics, by engaging into any aspect of a mega science experiment, right? The UN 
the United Nations Sustained Development Goals have laid out for us a charter of how a healthy planet and healthy people uh, can be sustained uh, on the globe. So whatever touches you, you want to connect, you want to upskill, you want to uh, look at what are our national priorities and look at international projects because the whole world, the whole uh, the globe has completely shrunk. It's so connected. It's so small. So all of us are connected to each other and you can absolutely make a difference. So I just want to leave you with something else on uh, um, what I have done. That is another free available book that you might want to take a look at. It is available on a website called juggernaut.in. It's for free. I'm really hoping, dreaming crazily that we will build our infrastructure in our country. We will have big facilities in our country. We will have a lot of girls out there in front taking leadership in the future. And I'm hoping that we will make a very big difference to our country and to society and to the world in general attention. Yeah, very nice lecture by Dr. Arjuna, Dr. Arjuna. Uh, thanks a lot to Dr. Arjuna for interesting lecture on unlocking secret of universe. You very nicely touched upon various aspects like Big Bang, accelerator for collider experiments, where two high energy particles collide. You also mentioned about the World Wide Web, which is a spin off from CERN accelerator application of high energy particles for curing cancer. I am sure that such kind of things created enthusiasm in, in, in the students and created a lot of curiosity for new things and they'll be interested in doing such things in future. So there will be now, uh, uh, Archana ji, maybe you can have, a, uh, you can have some uh, look at the questions in the uh, uh, box there and up some questions to, uh, to the students and rest will be taken care by my colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, pick up maybe the last question that says uh, it's from Manisha Kandyal. Why we can't detect dark matter? So first of all, we do not know what is dark matter. That's why we call it dark because you know we do not know what, what, what are the constituents. So how do we detect it? How do we detect something that we do not know exists? So we have to imagine it could have, it could be decaying into matter. So we need to design an experiment in such a way that we are able to catch everything. First, first of all, all around the interaction point so that we don't miss something because you know that E is equal to MC squared. So the the accelerator that we give should be equal to m1 plus m2 plus m3 etc square c, uh, c squared and if we miss some particle then it means that we have we are not able to balance this equation so first point is that we need to have a 3d 4d coverage of the collision dark matter particles will be very heavy as compared we do not know as compared to the particles that we create right now. It means it needs more energy to create a dark matter particle. That is the reason why we need to go to higher energy accelerators of the future. So at Large Hadron Collider, if dark matter particles are present, either they are like the Higgs boson, you know, it was very difficult to find the Higgs boson. You needed a certain amount of data to actually find one Higgs out of this data. Once we knew what is the energy, Energy. then we were energies of the accelerator to produce it and then study it. So imagine that you are on, a, you are in a big field or many, many big fields together and it's full of rice and you have to find one grain of which is made of gold. How are you going to do that? And the challenge for dark matter is hundred times more. So those are the kind of challenges, which is why we have not been able to detect dark matter up to now. I'm sure actually there, uh, are you taking some more questions otherwise?
they have some parees very uh, informal kind of yes. yes so i can take maybe one more question sure, sure. from gushin kaur gushin kaur is saying uh, please give the name of the website the free book i'm going to write the answer here is that okay can i write yeah, something? yeah, yeah i right. can type the answer oh but i can everyone see my answers hmm Or you can you can pick up some question and tell and uh, like uh, some information which well we can contact you and then respond to all the students. Okay. That's not a problem. Yeah, I'm writing on the chat and you can copy paste it. Yeah. The the website for the book. so please uh, transmit this uh, website i have put on the chat sure sure. <laughs> yeah. sure so my actually curiosity i think there is a curiosity by other students and teachers also that uh, right now this was 27 and now another one is planned with the 100 km kind of thing right so now the center of mass energy in the present one is how much and then the futuristic one is so how the much? present so one is again i mean how yes yeah the present one is actually um, operating at 6.5 tev tera electron volt on each so together they make it 13 tev and the, for the future it will be 100 tev that's the center of mass energy oh, for the 100 okay. tev and of course it will be tuned and there will be lots of studies that will go but that's like the ambition yeah right right yes i can mention perhaps couple of generic things because questions are similar a uh, couple of questions are very similar to that that there are lot yeah, of sure. opportunities for open data at cern so uh, students can pick up or school or college students can pick up some data from the elix and this is a, a good exercise for teachers and the students so that you know they can engage without doing anything you know you don't need to collaborate you don't need to sign any mou i was once contacted by a student no i was contacted by the press office at cern saying that archana do you know that uh, this school in in kerala a uh, student has got a prize for um, lhc physics data you know i was quite uh, uh, surprised as a go probably and i found out that one of the students had just logged in on lhc at home program and i do not know whether that program exists right now or not but i do know that data is open and there is open access and uh, i will be able to help putting you in touch how to get access to data and perhaps do an analysis you know like finding the higgs uh, boson and how it decays into other particles so this is a good instructive exercise for school and college yeah so uh, may i ask one question yeah ma'am sure, so it was very nice talk uh, the detectors uh, you have mentioned it's equally important for all these measurements that is true but uh, what about the future scenarios what are the challenges you might have because of the electronics point of view or other detecting point of view because there should be some limit right yeah so this is very important question that interesting so detectors you know they are like detectors you send out to space you cannot touch them once the lhc is operational you can only come back to them when lhc stops working and the radiation let's say heat has cooled down only then you are able to bring out your detectors and treat them so uh, we have to design these detectors and it takes typically 10 years to come to the point where you are able to say that your detector will be able to sustain this amount of radiation this amount of electronics as well and that it will be able to perform with full efficiency because you know if your efficiency starts drop then you will miss this physics that you are going to take with the detector so yes the as you rightly say that there is a limit and we define that limit that 15 years of operation at lhc was our target when we designed instruments and uh, sensors for the lhc 
for the tracker, you know, it's based on silicon and we have operated the tracker from 2010, we operated until 2025. So say 10 years of operation, including the downtimes. And in 2025, the whole tracker is going to be replaced with a new tracker because of radiation damage. So the limits are known and they have to be commensurate with the physics goals. And uh, electronics similarly, and sometimes we are replacing only the electronics in the experiment. And many bits and pieces of the whole CMS has seen a lot of replacements because like you rightly said, in five years, you know, technology, then you can't just pull out everything and put something new there, right? So you have to make planned interventions that in five years or 10 years, we will upgrade. And that's what's going on right now, because right now the LHC is in a stop mode and it will restart in January. It has been in stop mode for one and a half years. So in two years, we will finish our upgrades and it will restart in January. That's the time when we upgrade all the electronics and uh, all the other things that we need to do in situ. Things we want to do outside, you know, like algorithms or software, those kind of upgrades can be done late uh, online and as we go along. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, actually this, uh, uh, when you go higher and higher energy, more and more particles come out, a lot of data is there. Signals also a challenge, I think, because by the time you are processing a signal in, I don't know, currently in uh, some microsecond or something, another particle comes in and how, uh, how to take care of this. So you have to have multiple detectors. So there have to be a lot of uh, strategies for such kind of detection in this. Yeah. And electronics is also a challenging thing. Yeah. Absolutely. We have uh, 25 nanoseconds between collisions. And in yeah. this 25 nanoseconds, we have to make decisions. So our detectors have to be sub 10 nanoseconds in, yeah. so that we can whittle it down to something smaller. You know, you don't want to keep every single data. You have to keep data, uh, which is interesting. So that decision has to be made and that's called a okay. trigger. Okay. So okay. Yeah. That's a trigger system that has that is completely based on electronics, FPGAs, uh, and you know, front ends that are able, that are smart front ends. You know, with uh, with FPGAs that are able to just send out data that is interesting yeah. only, and then we do the second order in uh, 10, 10 uh, microseconds later, uh, two hundred fifty, and then the when we are sure that this is good data, right. then it's sent off to right. So basically, data. filtering out the events of interest from the yeah. large chunk of events. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So very good. So I think uh, rest of the questions we can take uh, on the uh, by emails. And uh, if we have any query where we cannot answer, we will definitely be in touch with you. And it was wonderful having time with you and your lecture with us. And as I said, that most welcome whenever you come to uh, Dehradun. Although you told me that you have been here two years back, but it's a very nice place, uh, and you will enjoy. And our students will be very benef uh, benefited with your interaction with you. A uh, lot of curiosity in the students. And uh, Thank it will you. be excellent for us, actually. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity. And I hope that the students are excited to at least uh, look and uh, find more information. And of course, I'm Aris. I will definitely get in touch whenever that's feasible. Thank you very much once again. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll also like to uh, thank my colleagues uh, in the panel member, uh, Dr. Sarat Lal, uh, Dr. Rajiv, and uh, the person behind managing the show webinar is uh, Mr. Siddharth. And uh, maybe I can request Siddharth to display the next lecture. So students actually, uh, should uh, fill up the uh, feedback form, which is there in their uh, area. And the next lecture is on 24th of July, Accelerator in Science and Technology. So this is by Dr. Avid Roy. And so see you on 24th.
July and that time as as usual. So today was the especially at 3 p.m. because uh, uh, Dr. Ireland and now uh, in uh, in Switzerland. So with this, uh, I uh, this is the feedback form uh, which you should fill up, and uh, we'll see you all on 24 July. Thank you, Vanna Ji, to you also, and uh, we'll be in touch with IPA for further things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye to everyone.